Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara, Jamie, Lily, and Chloe. And as always, I want to remind you, please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And uh, without further ado, we're going to get back into a uh, summary and analysis of Chapter 1 of Mice and Men. Okay, we're doing a summary and analysis of Chapter 1 of Mice and Men, and then we're going to read Chapter 2. Two men dressed in denim jackets and trousers and wearing black sh shapeless hats walk single file down a path near the pool. Both men carry blanket rolls called bindles on their shoulders. The smaller, wiry man is George Milton. Behind him is Lenny Small, a huge man with large eyes and sloping shoulders, walking at a gait that makes him resemble a huge bear. When Lenny drops near the pool's edge and begins to drink like a hungry animal, George cautions him that the water may not be good. This is advice is necessary because Lenny's mentally just he's to say he's special needs and doesn't real, realize the possible dangers. The two are on their way to a ranch where they can get temporary work and George want, warns Lenny not to say anything when they arrive because Lenny forgets things very quickly. George must make him repeat even the smallest instructions. Lenny also likes to pet soft things in his pocket. He has a dead mouse, which George confiscates and throws into the weeds beyond the pond. Lenny retrieves the dead mouse, and George once again catches him and gives Lenny a lecture about the trouble he causes when he wants to pet soft things. They were run out of the last town because Lenny touched the girl's soft dress, and she screamed. Lenny offers to, ha to leave and go live in a cave, causing George to soften his complaint and tell Lenny perhaps they can get a puppy that can withstand Lenny's petting. As they get ready to eat and sleep for the night, Lenny asks George to repeat their dream of having their own ranch where Lenny will be able to tend rabbits. George does so and then warns Lenny that if anything bad happens, Lenny is to come back to this spot and hide in the brush before George falls asleep, Lenny tells him they must have a many rabbits of various colors. The analysis. Steinbeck accomplishes a number of goals in the first chapter of his story. He sets the tone and atmosphere of the story's location, introduces his two main characters, begins some thematic considerations, adds imagery and foreshadows later events in the story. All of this is accomplished with great economy and careful attention to word choices and repetition. When the story opens, for example, they, the, settling, the setting is a few miles south of Soledad, California, near the Salinas River. Soledad is a Spanish word that translates into loneliness or solitude, a reference to one of the novel's main themes. Steinbeck's novel is written as though it is a play. In fact, after its publication, Steinbeck turned it into a play that opened on Broadway. The novel has six scenes, or six chapters, and each begins with a setting that is described in much the same way that a stage setting is described. For example, in the first scene, there's a path, a sycamore tree near an ash pile from past travelers' fires and a pool. All the action in this scene occurs in this one spot, much like a stage setting. After the main action in the scene, the focus pulls away from the action preparing the reader for the next scene. In the first chapter, for example, when the characters settle down to sleep for the night, the focus pulls away from the men to the dimming coal of their campfire, to the hills, and finally to the sycamore leaves that whispered in the little night breeze. Steinbeck is a master of description, and one of his many passions was the California landscape. The setting in this novel contains the golden foothold slopes, and the strong and rocky Gabillion Mountains. It is quiet and natural with sycamores, sand leaves, and gentle breeze. The rabbits, lizards, and herons are out in the peaceful setting. The only signs of man are a worn footpath beaten hard by boys going swimming in tramps looking for campsite. Piles of ashes made by many fires and limbs worn smooth by men who have sat on it. 
the two main characters are introduced first by the description and then with their names. Their physical portrayal emphasizes both their similarities and their individuality. They both wear similar clothes and carry blanket rolls, and the larger man imitates the smaller, but they are more dissimilar than they are alike. One is huge and shapeless, the other small and carefully defined. Lenny, the larger man, lumbers along heavily like a bear. George is small and has slender arms and small hands. The men also react differently to the pond. Lenny practically immerses himself in the water, snorting it up and drinking in long, greedy gulps. He fills his hat and puts it on his head, letting the water trickle merrily down his shoulders. George, on the other hand, is more cautious, wondering about the quality of the water before he drinks a small sample. And okay. In the descriptions and interactions, Steinbeck shows the men's relationship. George takes care of Lenny, who is childlike and mentally handicapped, constantly giving him advice and instructions. Don't say anything tomorrow when we get to the ranch. Come back here if there is any trouble. Don't drink the water before you check out its quality. Don't touch dead animals. But George also realizes that Lenny cannot remember or follow these simple instructions. George also carries Lenny's work card, knowing that Lenny would lose it. What George does not realize is how potentially dangerous Lenny is. He, I mean, he's special needs. And back then, they didn't understand as much. And, you know, nowadays they would have him in a, in a home where he could be taken care of. All Lenny's transgressions thus far have been relatively minor. He has unintentionally killed a mouse and frightened the girl in weed, but he has done so innocently, as will be discovered later. George mistakenly believes that he can protect Lenny from himself because Lenny will do anything George says. But Lenny's strength, his size, his mental handicap, and his fondness of soft things conspire against them. George seems to be of two minds when it comes to Lenny. He complains constantly that if he did not have Lenny, he would be done with a huge responsibility. He could go to town, drink what he wanted, have a girlfriend, shoot pool, and in general have a life. Tired of constantly reminding Lenny of things he should remember, George gets quickly angry when Lenny forgets to get the firewood, for example, and instead goes after the dead mouse. On the other hand, George's anger is quickly under control, and he blames himself for scolding Lenny. In fact, Steinbeck makes clear that despite his complaining and frustration, George looks out for Lenny and genuinely cares for him. The fact that George has repeated his instructions many times, the fact that he scolds Lenny for doing the things like petting the dead mouse or drinking the untested water that could hurt him, and most importantly, the fact that George retells the story of their shared dream indicates the close relationship the two men have. In fact, George acts as a parent towards Lenny. He treats Lenny as one would, would treat a child. He laughs a great deal at Lenny's words, and because he knows how much Lenny likes soft things, he promises to try to get Lenny a puppy and let him care for the rabbits when they finally get their own ranch. A recurring motive in the novel is George and Lenny's dream of owning their own farm. It becomes obvious that these two men have traveled together for a long time because Lenny knows the words of the dream by heart. And he can finish the sentences even though he does not remember where he and George are going tomorrow. George's voice echoing this dream seems almost like a prayer. He emphasizes that the dream makes them special. They are different from other wandering migrants who have no family and no home. They have each other and someday they will have a farm of their own where they can live off the fat of the land. They are describing the American dream of owning land, being independent, having material possessions that provide security and in general running their own lives. Lenny's interpretation of this dream is that he will tend the rabbits, soft furry animals that provide him with a feeling of security. This is a place where he won't be scared or running because he has done a bad thing. Lenny's voice fills with laughter and happiness because safety means soft things and tending the rabbits. Steinbeck also begins the animal imagery that will continue throughout his story. Lenny is often compared to a bear with his huge size and strength. His hands are described as paws and he is always associated with rabbits and mice. He snorts like a horse out the stream and circles like a terrier when he does not want to bring the dead mouse to George. These animal images lead caref careful readers to question Lenny's future. 
with his enormous strength and his truck and his lack of intelligence, common sense, and responsibility, Lenny causes the reader to wonder how well he fits into human society. Especially one that doesn't understand and doesn't really make any allowances for people with special needs. The title itself foreshadows the events that unfold and the ultimate tragedy of all the characters. Steinbeck thought about naming the story something that happened. The stark, unfeeling title could easily fit the story's ending. Instead, he chose a phrase from Robert Burns' poem to a mouse on turning her up in her nest with a plow. November 1785, which contains the following lines. The best laid schemes of mice and men. Gang after glay often go awry. And lay a snot but a grief and pain for promised joy. And that is the end of the summary and analysis for chapter one. And we are going to get into chapter two. Chapter two, the bunkhouse was a long rectangular building. Inside the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted in three walls. There were small square windows and in the fourth a solid door with a wooden latch. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Over each bunk there was nailed an apple box with the opening forward so that it made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk and these shelves were loaded with little articles soap and talcum powder, razors and those western magazines ranch men loved to read and scoff at and secretly believe. And there were medicines on the shelves and little vials, combs and from nails on the box side, sides, a few neckties. Near one wall there was a black cast iron stove, its stovepipe going straight up through the ceiling. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun threw a bright dust-laden bar through one of the side windows and an in and out of the beam flies shot like rushing stars. The wooden latch raised, the door opened, and a tall, stoop-shouldered old man came in. He was dressed in blue jeans, and he carried a big push broom in his left hand. Behind him came George, and behind George Lenny. The boss was expecting you last night, the old man said. He was sore as hell when you wasn't here to go out this morning. He pointed with his right arm, and out of the sleeve came a round stick-like wrist, but no hand. You can have them two beds there, he said, indicating the two bunks near the stove. George stepped over and threw his blankets down on the burlap sack of straw. That was a mattress. He looked into his box shelf and then picked a small yellow can from it say what the hell's this i don't know said the old man it says positively kills lice roaches and other scourges what the hell kind of bed you given us anyway we don't want to no pant pants rabbits the old swamper shifted his broom and held it between his elbow and his side while he held out his hand for the can he studied the label carefully tell you what he said finally last guy that had this bed was a blacksmith hell of a nice fella and as clean a guy as you want to meet Used to wash his hands even after he ate. Then how come he got graybacks? George was working up a slow anger. Then he put his bindle on the neighboring bunk and sat down. He watched George with open mouth. Tell you what, said the old swamper. This here's blacksmith, name of Whitey, was the kind of guy that would put that stuff around even if there wasn't no bugs, just to make sure. See? Tell you what he used to do. At meals, at meals he'd peel his boiled potatoes and he'd take out every little spot, no matter what kind before he'd eat, eat it. And if there was a red splotch on an egg, he'd scrape it off. Finally, quit about the food. That's the kind of guy he was, clean. Used to dress up Sundays even when he wasn't going no place. Put on a necktie even. And then set in the bunkhouse. I ain't so sure, said George skeptically. What did you say he quit for? The old man put the elbow can in his pocket and he rubbed his bristly white whiskers with his knuckles. Why? He just quit the way a guy will. Says it was the food. Just wanted to move. Didn't give no other reason but the food. Just says, give me my time one night the way any guy would. George lifted his tot and tick and looked underneath it. He leaned over and inspected the sacking closely. Immediately, Lenny put up, got up and did the same with his bed. Finally, George seemed satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf his razor and a bar of soap. 
his comb and bottle of pills, his liniment and leather wristband. Band. Then he made his bed up neatly with blankets, the old man said. I guess the boss will be out here in a minute. He was sure burned when you wasn't here this morning. Come right in when we was eating breakfast and says, Where the hell's them new men? And he gave give the stable buck hell too. George patted a wrinkle out of his bed and sat down. Give the stable buck hell, he asked? Sure. You see, the stable buck's a, a Negro. They were uh, racist. Negro, huh? Yeah. Nice fella, too. Got a crooked back where a horse kicked him. The boss gives him hell when he's mad. But the stable buck don't give a damn about that. He reads a lot. Got books in his room. What kind of a guy is the boss, George asks. Well, he's a pretty nice fella. Gets pretty mad sometimes, but he's pretty nice. Tell you what, no. What he's done, know what he done Christmas? Bring a gallon of whiskey right in here and says, Drink hearty, boys. Christmas comes but once a year. Hell he did, whole gallon. Yes, sir, Jesus, we had fun. They let the Negro come in. <clears throat> in that night, little Skinner, name of Smitty, took after the Negro. Done pretty good, too. The guys wouldn't let him use his feet, so the Negro got him. If he could have used his feet, Smitty says he would have killed the Negro. <clears throat> the guy said on account of the Negro's got a crooked back. Smitty can't use his feet. He paused in relish of the memory. After that, the guys went into Soledad and raised hell. I didn't go in there. I ain't got the poop no more. Lenny was just finished making his bed. The wood... Wooden latch raised again, and the door opened. A little stocky man stood in the open doorway. He wore blue jean trousers, a flannel shirt, a black unbuttoned vest, and a black coat. His thumbs were stuck in his belt. On each side of a square of steel buckle on his head was a soiled brown Stetson hat, and he wore high-heeled boots and spurs to prove he was not a laboring man. The old swamper looked quickly at him and then shuffled to the door, rubbing his whiskers with his knuckles as he went. Them guys just come, he said, and shuffled past the boss and out the door. The boss stepped into the room with the short, quick steps of a fat-legged man. I wrote Murray and Reddy. I wanted to. Two men this morning. You got your work slips? George reached in it to his pocket and produced the slips and handed them to the boss. It wasn't Murray and Reddy's fault. Says right here on the slip that you was to be here for work this morning. <clears throat> George looked down at his feet. Bus driver gave, gave us a bum steer, he said. We had a <clears throat> walk ten miles. Says we was here when we wasn't. We couldn't get no rides in the morning. The boss squinted his eyes. Well, I had to send out the grain team short two buckers, buckets. Buckers, actually. Won't do any good to go out now till after dinner. He pulled his time book out of his pocket and opened it where a pencil was stuck between the leaves. <clears throat> George scowled meanfully at, meaningfully at Lenny, and Lenny nodded to show that he understood. The boss looked his pencil. What's your name? George Milton. <clears throat> and what's yours, George said. His name's Lenny Small. The names were entered in the book. Let's see. This is the 20th noon, the 20th. He closed the book. Where you boys been working? Up around weeds, said George. You too? Too? Too, Lenny? Yeah, him too, said George. The, bo uh, the boss pointed a playful finger at Lenny. He ain't much of a talker, is he? No, he ain't. But he's sure it's a hell of a good, of a good worker. Strong as a bull. Lenny smiled to himself. Strong as a bull, he repeated. George scowled at him, and Lenny dropped his head in shame at having forgotten. The boss said suddenly, Listen, Small. Lenny raised his head. What can you do? In a panic, Lenny looked at George for help. He can do anything you tell him, said George. He's a good skinner. He can wrestle grain bags, dry a drive a cultivator. He can do anything. Just give him a try. The bo boss turned on George. Then why don't you let him answer what you're trying to put over? And back then, they didn't understand anybody. Special needs or... Kind of racist types. Just mean people. George broke in loudly. Oh, I ain't saying he's bright. 
He ain't, but I say he's a goddamn good worker. He can put up a 400-pound bail. Boss liberally put the little book in his pocket. He hooked it, his thumbs in his belt and squinted one eye <clears throat> nearly closed. <coughs> Excuse me. Say, what you selling, huh? I said, what stake you got in this guy? You taking his pay away from him? No, of course I ain't. Why you think I'm selling him out? Well, I've never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. I'd just like to know what your interest is. George said, he's my cousin. I told his old lady I'd take care of him. He got kicked in the head by a horse when he was a kid. He's all right, just ain't bright, but he can do anything you tell him. The boss turned half away. Well, God knows he don't need any brains to buck barley bags, but don't you try to put <clears throat> nothing over Milton. I got my eye. Put nothing over Milton. I got my eye on you. Why'd you quit and weed? Job was done, said George promptly. What kind of job? We, we was digging a cesspool. All right, but don't try to put nothing over, because you can't get a <clears throat> away with nothing. I've seen wise guys before. Go on with the grain teams after dinner. <clears throat> they are picking up barley at the threshing machine. Go out with Slim's team. Slim? Yeah. Big tall Skinner. You'll see him at dinner. He turned abruptly and went to the door. But before he went out, he turned and looked for a long moment at the two men. When the sound of his footsteps had died away, George turned on Lenny. So he wasn't going to say a word. You was gonna leave your big flapper shut and leave me do the talk and damn near lost us the job. Lenny stared hopelessly at his hands. I forgot, George. Excuse me. Yeah, you forgot. You always forget. And I got to talk you out of it. He sat down heavily on the bunk. Now he's got his eye on us. Now we got to be careful and not make no slips. You keep your big flapper shut after this. He fell morosely silent. George, what you want now? I wasn't kicked in the head with no horse, was I, George? you a damn good thing if you was, George said viciously. Save everybody a hell of a lot of trouble. He said I was your cousin, George. Well, that was a lie, and I'm damn glad it was. If I was a relative of yours, I'd shoot myself. He stopped suddenly. Wow. He's... This kind of bugs me. He stopped suddenly... Stepped to the open front door and peered out. Say what the hell you do and listen. The old man came slowly into the room. He had his broom in his hand, and at his heels there walked a drag-footed sheepdog, gray of muzzle and with pale, blind old eyes. The dog struggled lamely to the side of the room and lay down, grunting softly to himself and licking his grizzled, moth-eaten coat. The swamper watched him until he was settled. I wasn't listening. I was just standing in the shade a minute, scratching my dog. I just now finished the swamp and... Out the wash house. You was poking your big ears into our business, George said. I don't like nobody yet nosy. The old man looked uneasily from George to Lenny and then back. I just come there, he said. I didn't hear nothing you guys was saying. I ain't interested in nothing you was say saying. A guy on a ranch don't never listen, nor he don't ask no questions. Damn right he don't, said George, slightly mollified. Not if he wants to stay working long. But he was just reassured by the swamper's defense. Come on in and sit down a minute, he said. That's a hell of an old dog. Yeah, I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheep dog when he was younger. He stood his broom against the wall, and he rubbed his white bristled cheek with his knuckles. How'd you like the boss, he asked. Pretty good. Seemed all right. He's a nice fellow, the swamper agreed. You gotta take him. Right. At that moment, a young man came into the bunkhouse, a thin young man with a brown face, with brown eyes, and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and like the boss, he wore high heel boots. Seen my old man, he asked. The swamper said, he was just here a minute ago. Curly went over to the cookhouse, I think. I'll try to catch him, said Curly. His eyes passed over the new men, and he stopped. He glanced coldly at George and then at Lenny. His arms gradually bent at the elbows, and his, eye, and his hands closed into fists. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. Lenny squirmed under the look and shifted his feet nervously. Curly stepped gingerly close to him. You the new guys the old man was waiting for? We just come in, said George. Let the big guy talk. Lenny twisted with embarrassment. George said, suppose he doesn't want to talk. He don't want to talk. 
Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's got to talk when he's spoke to. What the hell are you going to get into it for? We traveled together, said George coldly. Coldly. Oh, so it's that way. George was tense and motionless. Yeah, it's that way. Lenny was looking helplessly to George for instructions. And you won't let the big t guy talk, is that it? He can talk if he wants to tell you anything, he nodded slightly to Lenny. We just come in, said Lenny softly. Curly stared levelly at him. Well, next time you answer when you're spoke to, he turned toward the door and walked out. And his elbows were still bent out a little. George watched him out, and then he turned back to the swamper. Say what the hell's he got on his shoulder, Lenny didn't do nothing to him. The old man looked cautiously at the door to make sure no one was listening. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He's done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight and he's handy. Well, let him be handy, said George. He don't have to take after Lenny. Lenny didn't do nothing to him. What's he got against Lenny? The swamper considered, well, tell you what, Curly's like a lot of little guys. He hates big guys. That's what they call the Little Caesar Complex, or the Little Napoleon Complex. He's all the time picking scraps with the big guys, kind of like he's mad at them because he ain't a big guy. <laughs> you seem like little guys, like little little guys like that, ain't you? Always scrappy. You know the kind of like little yapping dogs. Sure," said George. "I seen plenty of tough little guys, but this curly better not make no mistakes about Lenny. Lenny ain't handy, but this curly punk is gonna get hurt if he messes around with Lenny." "Well, Curly's pretty handy," the swamper said. Skeptically, never did seem right to me. Suppose Curly jumps a big guy and licks him. Everybody says what a game guy Curly is, and suppose he does the same thing and gets licked. Then everybody says the big guy ought to pick somebody his own size, and maybe they gang up on the big guy. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't giving nobody a chance. George was watching the door. He said ominously, Well, he better watch out for Lenny. Lenny ain't no fighter, but Lenny's strong and quick, and Lenny don't sh know no rules. He walked to the square table and sat down on one of the boxes. He gathered some of the cards together and shuffled them. The old man sat down on another box. Don't tell Curly, I said. None of this. He'd slough me. He just don't give a damn. Won't ever get canned because his old man's the boss. George cut the cards and began turning them over, looking at each other and throwing it down in a pile. He said, this guy, Curly, sounds like a son of a bitch to me. I don't like mean little guys. Seems to me like he's worse lately, said the swamper. He got married a couple of weeks ago. Wife lives over in the boss's house. Seems like Curly's a is cockier than ever since he got married. George grunted, maybe he's showing off for his wife. The swamper war warmed to his gossip. You seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah, I seen it. Well that glove's glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I'll tell you what, Curly says he's keeping that hand soft for his wife. What that means. George studied the cards absorbedly. That's a dirty thing to tell around, he said. The old man was reassured. He had drawn a derogatory statement from George. He felt safe now, and he spoke more confidently. Wait till you see Curly's wife. George cut the cards again and put out a solitaire leg. Slowly and deliberately. Purdy? Yes, casually. Yeah, Purdy, but... George studied these cards, but what? Well, she's got the eye. <laughs> oh, great. In other words, uh, setting you up for a fall there. Yeah, I married two weeks and got the eye. Maybe that's why Curly's pants is full of ants. I seen her give Slim the eye. Slim's a jerk liner, jerk line skinner. Hell of a nice fellow. Slim don't need to wear no high heeled boots and grain team. I seen her give Slim the eye. Curly never seen it, and I seen her give Carlson the eye. George pretended a lack of interest. Looks like we was gonna have fun. The swamper stood up from his box. Know what I think? George did not answer. Well, I think Curly's married a tart. <laughs> he ain't the first, said George. There's plenty done that. The old man moved down, moved toward the door, and his ancient dog lifted his head and peered about and then got painfully to his feet to follow. I gotta be setting out the wash basins for the guys. The team'll be in here before long. You guys gonna back, gonna buck the barley? Yeah. You won't tell Curly nothing I said. Hell no. Well, you look here. Look look her over, mister. You see if she ain't a tart. He stepped out the door into the brilliant sunshine. George laid down his cards thoughtfully, turned his piles of three. 
he built four clubs on his ace pile. The sun square was on the floor now, and the flies whipped through it like heh, like sparks, and sounded jingling the harness and the croak of heavy laden axles or sounded from it from outside. From the distance came a clear call, stable buck, ooh, stable buck. And then where the hell is that goddamn uh, Negro? Nice people. George stared at his solitaire leg, and then he flounced the cards together and turned around to Lenny. Lenny was lying down on the bunk watching him. Look, Lenny, this here ain't no setup. I'm scared. You're gonna have trouble with that curly guy. I seen that kind before. He was kind of feeling you out. He figures he's got you scared and he's gonna take a sock at you the first chance he gets. Lenny's eyes were frightened. I don't want no trouble, he said plaintively. Don't let him sock me, George. George got up and went over to Lenny's bunk and sat down on it. I hate that kind of bastard, he said. I've seen plenty of them, like the old guy says. Curly D don't take no chances. He always wins, he thought for a moment. If he tangles with you, Lenny, we're going to get the can. Don't make no mistake about that. He's the boss's son. Look, Lenny, you try to keep away from him, will you? Don't never speak to him. If he comes in here, you move clear to the other side of the room. Will you do that, Lenny? I don't want no trouble anymore. I never done nothing to him. Well, that won't do you no good if Curly wants to plug himself for up for a fighter. Just don't have nothing to do with him, will you remember? Sure, George, I ain't gonna say a word. The sound of the approaching grain teams was louder. Thud of big hooves on the hard ground, drag of bra brakes and the jingle of trace chains. Men were calling back and forth from the teams. George, sitting on the bunk beside Lenny, frowned frowned as he thought. Lenny asked timidly, You ain't mad, George. I ain't mad at you. I'm mad at this here curly bastard. I hoped we was going to get a little steak together. Maybe a hundred dollars. He tone, his tone grew decisive. Hey, Lily, I'll let you out soon. You keep him from curly, Lenny. Sure I will, George. I won't say a word. You keep away from curly, Lenny. Don't let him pull you in, but if the son of a bitch socks you, let him have it. Let him have what, George? Never mind, never mind, I'll tell you when. I hate that kind of a guy. Look, Lenny, if you get in any kind of trouble, you remember what I told you to do. Lenny raised up on his elbow. His face contorted with thought. Then his eyes moved so moved sadly to George's face. If I get in any trouble, you ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. That's not what I meant. You remember where we slept last night, down by the river? Yeah, I remember. Oh, sure, I remember. I go and... There and hide in the brush. Hide till I come for you. Don't let nobody see you. Hide in the brush by the river. Say that over. Hide in the brush by the river. Down in the brush by the river. If you get in trouble. If I get in trouble. A brake screeched outside. A call came. Stable buck. Oh, stable buck. George said, Stay. say it over to yourself, Lenny, so you won't forget it. Both men glanced up for the rectangle of sunshine in the doorway was cut off. A girl was standing there looking in. She had full... Rouged lips and wide-spaced eyes, heavily made up. Her fingernails were red. Her eyes hung in little rolled clusters like sausages. She wore a cotton house dress and red mules on the inset depths of which were little bouquets of red ostrich feathers. I'm looking for Curly, she said. Her voice had a nasal, brittle quality. George looked away from her and then back. He was in here a minute ago, but he, he went. Oh, she put her hands behind her back and leaned against the door frame so that her body was thrown forward. You're the new fella that just come, ain't you? Yeah. Lenny's eyes moved down over her body. And though she did not seem to be looking at Lenny, she bridled a little, little. She looked at her fingernails. Sometimes Curly's in here, she explained. George brusquely. Well, he ain't now. If he ain't, I guess I better go look. I better look someplace else, she said playfully. Lenny watched her, fascinated. George said, I see him out past the word you was looking for him. She smiled archly and twitched her body. Nobody can't blame a person for looking, she said. There were footsteps behind her going by. She turned her head. Hi, Slim, she said. Slim's voice came through the door. Hi, good looking. I'm trying to find Curly, Slim. Well, you ain't trying very hard. I seen him going in your house. She was suddenly apprehensive. Bye, boys, she called into the bunkhouse, and she hurried away. George looked around at Lenny. Jesus, what a tramp, he said. So that's what Curly picks for a wife. She's purdy, said Lenny defensively. Yeah, and she's sure hiding it. Curly got his work 
ahead of him. Bet she'd clear out for 20 bucks. Lanny still stared at the doorway where she had been. Gosh, she was purty. Smiled admiringly. George looked quickly down at him, then he looked, took him by an ear and shook him. Listen to me, you crazy bastard, he said fiercely. Don't you even take a look at that bitch. I don't care what she says and what she does. I seen him poisoned before. But I never seen him no piece of jail but I never seen no piece of jail bait worse than her. You leave her be. Lenny tried to disengage his ear. I never done nothing, George. No, you never. But when she was standing in the doorway, showing her legs, you wasn't looking the other way neither. I never meant no harm, George. Honest, I never. Well, you keep away from her, because she's a, she's a rat trap. If I ever seen one, you let Curly take the rap. He let himself in for it, glove full of Vaseline, George said disgustedly, and I better, and I bet he's eating raw eggs and right into the patent medicine houses. Lenny cried out suddenly, I don't like this place, George. This ain't no good place. I want to get out of here. We got to keep it till we get, get a stake. We can't help it. Lenny, we will get out just as soon as we can. I don't like it no better than you do. He went back to the table and set out a new solitaire hand. No, I don't like it, he said. For two bits, I'd shove out of here. If we can get just a few dollars in the poke, we'll shove off and go up the American River and pan gold. We can make maybe a couple of dollars a day there. We might hit a pocket. Lenny leaned eagerly towards him. Let's go, George. Let's get out of here. It's mean here. We gotta stay, George said shortly. Shut up now. The guys will be coming in. From the washroom nearby came the sound of running water and ra rattling basins. George studied the cards. Maybe we ought to wash up, he said. But we ain't done nothing to get dirty. A tall man stood in the doorway. He held the crushed Stetson hat under his arm while he combed his long, black, damp hair straight back. Like the others, he wore blue jeans and a short denim jacket. When he had finished combing his hair, he moved into the room, and he moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. He was a jerk-line skinner and the prince of the ranch, capable of driving 10, 16, even 20 mules with a single line to the leaders. He was capable of killing a fly in the wheeler's butt with a bull whip without touching the mule. There was a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk st stopped when he spoke. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. This was Slim, the jerk-line skinner. His hatchet face was ageless. He might have been thirty-five or fifty. His ear heard more than was said to him, and his slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of undressing beyond thought. His hands, large and lean, were in a delicate, were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer. He smoothed out his crushed hat, creased it in the middle, and put it on. He looked kindly at the two in the bunkhouse. It's brighter a brighter than a bitch outside, he said gently. You can't hardly see nothing in here. You the new guys? Just come, said George. Got a buck gonna buck barley? That's what the boss says. Slim sat down in the box, on a box across the table from George. He studied the solitaire hand that was upside down to him. Hope you get on my team, he said. His voice was very gentle. I got a pair of punks on my team that don't know a barley bag from a blue ball. You guys ever bucked any barley? Hell yeah, said George. I ain't nothing to scream about, but that big bastard there can put up more grain alone than more pears can. Lenny, who had been following the conversation back and forth with his eyes, smiled complacently at the compliment. Slim looked approvingly at George for having given the compliment. He leaned over the table and snapped the corner of his loose card. You guys travel around together? His tone was friendly and invited confidence without demanding it. Sure, said George. We kind of look after each other, he indicated Lenny with his thumb. He ain't a bright hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice fella, but he ain't bright. I knew, knew him for a long time. Slim looked through George and beyond him. Ain't many guys travel around together, he mused. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. It's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know, said George. A powerful, big-stomached man came into the bunkhouse, his head still dripped water from the scrubbing and dowsing. Hi, Slim, he said, and then stopped and stared at George and Lenny. These guys just come, said Slim, by way of introduction. Glad to meet you, the big man said. My name's Carlson. I'm George Milton. 
This here is Lenny Small. Glad to meet you, Carlson said again. He ain't very small. He chuckled softly at his joke. Ain't small at all, he repeated. Meant to ask just then, how's your bitch? I seen she wasn't under your wagon this morning. She slangs her, slang her pups last night, said Slim. Nine of them. I drowned four of them right off. She couldn't feed that many. Ugh, disturbing. Got five left, huh? Yeah, five. I kept the biggest. What kind of dogs you think they're going to be? You drowned them. That's awful. I don't know, said Slim. Some kind of shepherds, I guess. That's the most kind I've seen around here. When she was in heat, Carlson went on. Got five pups, huh? Going to keep all of them? I don't know. Have to keep them a while so they can drink Lulu's milk. Carlson said thoughtfully. Well, look at here, Slim. I've been thinking. That dog of Candy's is so goddamn old he can't hardly walk. Stinks like hell, too. Every time he comes into the bunkhouse, I can smell him for two, three days. Why don't you get Candy to shoot his old dog? This book's disturbing to me. His old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up. I can smell the dog a mile away. Got no teeth. Damn near blind. Can't eat. Can't candy feeds him milk. Can't chew nothing else. George had been staring intently at Slim. Suddenly a triangle began to ring outside. Slowly at first, then faster and faster until the beat of it disappeared into one ringing sound. It stopped as suddenly as it had started. There she goes, said Carlson. Outside there was a burst of voices as a group of men went by. Slim stood up slowly with dig and with dignity. You guys better come on while there's still something to eat. Won't be nothing left in a couple of minutes. Carlson stepped back to let Slim proceed him, and then the two of them went out into the door. Out the door. Lenny was watching George excitedly. George rumpled his cards into a messy pile. Yeah, George said. I heard him, Lenny. I'll ask him. A brown and white one, Lenny cried excitedly. Come on, let's get dinner. I don't... It goes Chloe. I don't know whether he got a brown and white one. Lenny didn't move from his bunk. You ask him right away, George, so he won't kill no more of them. Well, at least he's got feelings. Sure, come on now. Get up on your feet. Lenny ro rolled off his bunk and stood up, and the two of them started for the door. Just as they reached it, Curly bounced in. You seen a girl around here? He demanded angrily. George said coldly, about half an hour ago, maybe. Well, what the hell was she doing? George stood still, watching the angry little man. He said insultingly, she said, she was looking for you. Curly seemed really to see George for the first time. His eyes flashed over George, took in his height, measured his reach, looked at his trim middle. Well, which way'd she go, he demanded him. Man, at last, I didn't know, said George. I didn't watch her go. Curly scowled at him and, turning, hurried out the door. George said, you know, Lenny, I'm scared I'm going to tangle that bastard myself. I hate his guts. Jesus Christ, come on. No, there won't be a damn thing left to eat. They went out the door. The sunshine lay in a thin line under the window. From a distance, there could be a, heard a rattle of dishes. After a moment, the ancient dog walked lamely in through the open door. He gazed about with mild, half-blind eyes. He sniffed and then lay down and put his head between his paws. Curly popped into the doorway again and stood looking into the room. The dog raised his head, but when Curly jerked out, the grizzled head sank to the floor again. And that's the end of Chapter 2. In the next video, we will summarize and analyze Chapter 2 and then get into Chapter 3. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell, and you stay safe and healthy, and you have a great day. Thank you.